So welcome everybody to this uh, mental health and society event uh, with, that we're calling uh, My COVID Research uh, Show and Tell. We have five different presenters that will be presenting each uh, about five minutes per study that they're working on. So there are several studies uh, that um, researchers at the Douglas are involved in. So our very first speaker is Alain Brunet. We're working, uh, we, we, uh, we launched a very large internet study uh, during the onset of the, the COVID. And uh, we have been, one question that we have been working on uh, is embodied in the title of my talk. PTSD is not the emblematic disorder of the COVID-19 pandemic. Adjustment disorder is. Um, so uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, uh, we noticed that uh, a lot of early reports came out being very alarmist uh, and publishing extremely high rates of self-reported PTSD symptoms and disorder. And uh, we were really puzzled by that and it led us to, um, to try to understand it. Um, and what we uh, suspected was that in that uh, research publishing high rates of PTSD, the life threat or exposure criterion has been considered as met de facto. Just because we are all in this COVID-19 thing, uh, it means, does it mean that we have been traumatized? Uh, so we were not convinced of that. And so we aim to examine the prevalence of PTSD caseness uh, but during the COVID, and we uh, also were interested in another parent disorder called adjustment disorder. Uh, and so we looked at the prevalence of the two, and we also tried to e e examine or explore uh, what were uh, some common idioms of distress that had been triggered by the COVID. So uh, we had two hypotheses once properly classified, COVID-related AD, adjustment disorder, will be more prevalent than COVID-related PTSD. And the other uh, hypothesis was more inductive. Using CART analyses, we explored the various idioms of distress uh, generated by the COVID among a sample of 5,913 subjects that we had amassed in about two months. So I apologize because this is very small, uh, but this is a CART analysis. And um, if you follow me uh, closely, you will see it's not difficult to understand and it yields really a lot of interesting information. So in the upper box, uh, it says uh, clinical cases, and you will see that the total um, is 5,913. So those are all the subjects that we had. Then CART looked for the, the best um, variable uh, to predict caseness. So caseness uh, means that you report a lot of symptoms on the IESR. And so uh, we forced the first variable, which was the life threat. And if you look at the node two uh, or box two, if you like, you will see that uh, the total is seven. That's 7%, 7 percent, seven percent of the sample experienced a life threat during uh, the COVID uh, and 93 did not. So um, among the 7%, those were the people, uh, nearly everybody, 95% of them uh, developed PTSD. Among those who did not experience a life threat, uh, the next uh, most powerful variable was experiencing fear, helplessness, or horror. And um, if you said no to that, I did not experience that, then uh, if you go to node four, uh, those were people who said, no, I did not experience fear, helplessness or horror during the COVID, but I experienced sadness and grief. And if you go one notch below among this subsample, there were also a group that said, I was worried about the safety of others. So those were two idioms of distress that uh, we found that explained um, a high number of cases. So experiencing sadness or losing someone, 
or uh, being worried about the safety of, of another person, like an elderly or a friend or a partner. On the left-hand side of this pyramid um, were the people who said, I experienced fear, helplessness, or, or horror, but I did not experience this sadness thing. So what did I experience? Well, essentially, they, they were experiencing primarily fear, helplessness, or horror. So it was a kind of anxiety profile. People were anxious and were really afraid of what might happen to themselves. They were anxious. And many of them, if you go one notch below, uh, said, I'm afraid of losing control over my emotions. So um, at the end of the day, uh, what we found out in that research is that 7% uh, of the sample, 6.7 more precisely, met the criteria for PTSD, but up to 55% met criteria for an adjustment disorder. And among the adjustment disorders, we found one resilient profile and four that had an adjustment. Uh, uh, so three had an adjustment-like disorder. One was marked by depression and mourning. The other one was marked by being worried about others. And the third one was being worried for oneself. So overall, five profiles, three in the AD group, one in the PTSD, and one resilient. That's all I had for you today. Fantastic, Anna. Uh, thanks for sticking to the time. It's absolutely perfect. Um, I'll ask one quick question. Can PTSD and adjustment disorder co-occur? Uh, co no, they can't. Because in order to suffer from PTSD, you need to have experienced a life threat. If the stressor that you experienced did not involve a life threat, then you would be diagnosed as suffering from an adjustment disorder. And so it's really um, a, a kind of uh, overrated thing uh, that uh, the COVID has led to uh, an epidemic of PTSD. Yes, we have seen that in uh, a lot of studies on pregnant women as well. Thank you very much. Um, if if uh, I'm I'm willing to stay after uh, one o'clock, um, if people want to have uh, more discussions and questions, but I'm going to stick to our schedule so we can be done. Nice to be here, and uh, I would like to thank you, Suzanne, for the organization of this presentation. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, I will not go uh, as Alain on presenting results, so I unfortunately do not have any result to present you at this point. So I will just go over uh, the, I have four projects uh, which uh, relate to uh, COVID-19. So I will just present you overall uh, each of the project, uh, the subject, uh, some information about the sam sam samples and uh, the objects for sure of the project. And I will finish my presentation with uh, some originality related to this uh, work. Uh, so the first project uh, that I have, um, it's uh, we, it's a pro project that uh, we will do uh, closely in partnership with the NSPQ, which is the Quebec Public Health Institute. So we will work on their uh, a very interesting uh, database, which uh, is called the SISMAC. So it's the Quebec Integrated Ke uh, Chronic Disease Surveillance System. It's a very inter interesting database since it integrated uh, the entire Quebec population, so uh, it's 8 million plus patients. Uh, and uh, we have all the information on the patient from 1996 to uh, 2021, uh, and as uh, soon we will have the 22 uh, data as well. So uh, this uh, SISMAC integrated uh, the basic uh, uh, administrative database that we have in Quebec. So the HANQ, which is the physician database, uh, the hospitalization database, which is medical. And uh, we have also the FIPA, uh, which integrated patients, so demographic information. And we have also the medication and the mortality uh, database. 
uh, here uh, the um, the objective of the project will be to investigating changes in services used for mental health reasons before and during the COVID pandemic in the Quebec population. We will compare, in fact, two cohorts before and during the COVID, so patients with mental disorder, including also patients with substance related disorder, and also will integrate uh, patients without mental disorder, but with uh, uh, but uh, taking a, a medication for mental health uh, problems. So uh, so this will be kind of a proxy of uh, having psychosocial distress. Uh, we will look at changes in total mental health services use in terms of PSN and, and no, but also in terms of frequency. Uh, we will look also specifically at, at the use of primary care, specialized care and acute care, which integrated uh, emergency, emergency department use and also hospitalization of Unfortunately, in those kind of database, uh, the only information that we have directly on COVID, it's in medical, where we have the information uh, on hospitalization for reason of COVID. Uh, and also uh, what we'll do in this research is we uh, will link uh, changes in total mental health services use with uh, different correlates, such as patient sociodemographic and clinical characteristic prior services use, including uh, some uh, quality of care indicators like uh, continuity or intensity or access to care. And uh, for sure, we will also uh, take consideration of the regulation timeframes of the pandemics. Um, the second project is very close to the, the one uh, related on the CISMAC. Uh, but here, uh, our team created a database uh, integrating 32,000 patients uh, from 14 uh, Quebec Addiction Treatment Centers, so les centres d'adaptation dépendance, CRD. Uh, for those patients, we have uh, data from 1996 to uh, soon 2021-22. Uh, and we have also uh, the same uh, databases that I already present for the CISNAC, but we have three more original databases, uh, which are the ECLSC, Community Healthcare Center Database, uh, the ED database, which uh, is uh, the, uh, called the BDCU, and we have also uh, the database from the, the Center Adaptation Dependance, which is called the 6CRD. The objective of this project, I will go very fast uh, because it's the same than in the CISMAC, so we are looking at changes in services used, uh, and we will look at two here uh, after the, the, the starting of the pandemic. Uh, so we'll look at the same outcome, but uh, uh, what is different in this, uh, this uh, project, it's related for sure uh, on patients with substance related disorder, but we have a larger set of data. We have information uh, in sociodemographic, uh, especially we have more data such as uh, patient living situation, principal occupation, criminal history, history of homelessness. Uh, we have also uh, several uh, types of substance related disorder integrated in, in this database. Uh, the two other projects uh, that I have are more based on surveys. Uh, they are projects where the data collection is not finished at this point, but will be very soon, uh, end of April uh, or light, light May uh, at last. Uh, so here, uh, the, the third project is related to high emergency department user, which are user uh, using often the emergency department uh, at least three or four times a year. Here we recruit 300 patients in 10 uh, Quebec uh, emergency department. Uh, this will be a 28 month data investigation. Uh, we uh, saw so each patient um, uh, were uh, responding to a one a one hour questionnaire. Uh, we have quantitative and qualitative information and we will link those uh, data uh, with uh, database available in the hospitalization settings uh, such as medical, BDCU, ECLSC, and we have also other uh, data uh, outpatient uh, on, on on patient care in those hospitalization settings. Uh, so here we'll look at the um, changes in patient so social 
uh, and health condition, including added COVID and services as you since uh, the, the starting of the pandemics. Uh, we will look especially more at uh, deterioration or increase in terms of income, work, quality of life, mental health status, consumption, suicidal thoughts, medical appointments, psychosocial support, ED use. Uh, this data will be associated with general social demographic and clinical condition of patient and quality of care indicators. Uh, for this research, we also interview uh, 87 uh, emergency department manager or clinician and also ID partners such as crisis centers. And here uh, we have questions such as changes in reason to use ID after the COVID. Uh, we look at changes also in ID management after the COVID, services so offering if, if efficacy of ID for treating patients and addressing high ID use. Uh, the last project that we have, um, it's also undergoing, but will be finished soon. Uh, it's a project about homeless individuals living in supported housing. Here we recruited at this point 300 individuals uh, in Montreal with the help of community-based organization. This is a 1.5 uh, survey. Uh, our survey and uh, we uh, it, it's we investigated for the full study we investigated quality of life and social integration but we uh, did have a, a COVID part uh, where we'll, we'll look at the same it will be the, it's almost the same question uh, then for the uh, investigation related to uh, high ID users so we look at deterioration or increase in outcome work social support etc uh, we look at uh, uh, also um, deterioration, deterioration or increase uh, in terms of uh, health condition and uh, also uh, in terms of services use and uh, we will link also those information specific on COVID with other general social demographic clinical and uh, services use information that we had in the larger research. Uh, and I will just finish on this slide um, talking. I, I want to talk about the originality of uh, the, uh, the overall research program for the full project. Uh, so uh, we have some, I think this is interesting, we have some longitudinal investigations. We know at this point that most of the research on the COVID are cross-sectional. Uh, we have also some project representative or quite representative of the Quebec population. Uh, we'll also know at this point that most of the COVID literature are, are more uh, based on web surveys, which are not representative of, of the full population. Uh, we also look at services use and the and especially total services use and primary care use. And we know at this point that most of the literature in terms of services use focus also on emergency department and hospitalization. And we have also a few of our study looking at vulnerable population. And we know that this uh, population, it's not easy to reach with web survey or telephone interview. So I've less been uh, investigate uh, until this point. So thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about four studies that I've been involved in. I'm not the PI on any of them, um, but they have to do with uh, objective hardship and subjective distress from the COVID pandemic. And I've got three studies of pregnant women and their unborn children and one on the elderly. So the objectives of this program uh, around COVID is to understand the effects of stress on vulnerable populations, in particular pregnant women and their unborn children, and also uh, the elderly uh, with or without cognitive decline. So when we talk about stress, um, what we do in, in my research program is we break stress down into three major components. So um, first is characterizing the objective situation or the event or the exposure uh, that is external to the person. Then secondly, um, cognitive appraisal, so the extent to which the person thinks that there's a stress and they feel threatened and they can cope. Uh, third is the level of subjective distress related to the event. And this is all important because the theory is that the greater the subjective distress, the higher will be uh, the person's uh, circulating cortisol 
And if the woman is pregnant, that cortisol can get through the placenta to the developing fetus and alter development. I don't know why I keep having trouble advancing my slides. So I started uh, looking at disasters with uh, the ice storm in 1998. Uh, and to characterize the objective level of hardship, I looked in the disaster literature and there were four broad um, characterizations or, or characteristics of uh, exposure to disasters. One is threat. So uh, in this questionnaire to these pregnant women in 1998, I included a bunch of questions about, uh, about threat. Uh, another ca uh, category is loss. So uh, for Project Ice Storm, we asked about damage to the home, lost income, and so on. Then there's the scope of the disaster for the individual. So how long does it last? Um, and then also it, it involves the intensity or the, the density of the disaster in the community. And then finally, change. So how much does a person's life change? So uh, with, um, with Project Ice Storm, we created a scale that um, had a maximum of eight points for each one of these categories. We just added them up. So we had this storm 32 variable. Um, so if, if I have any expertise at all at this point, after 20 some years of doing this uh, disaster research, it's, it's separating um, stress into the objective hardship. Um, we, uh, cognitive appraisal, we've always used a single item, which is taking into account all of the effects of the disaster on you and your family. What would you say have been the consequences of the disaster? And that's a scale from uh, one to five. And even in the ice storm, we showed that uh, totally irrespective of the number of days people were without electricity, that um, about as many women said that it was a positive experience as said that it was a negative experience. So, and this has been quite powerful over time. For subjective distress, um, we use the IESR, um, which was uh, translated in French by Alain Bonnet, which is how we got to know him. Um, but those PTSD symptoms are talking about how, what are your symptoms today, which could be months later than um, the actual disaster. So for all but the ice storm, we included measures of peritraumatic distress and dissociation. So what was the person experiencing at the time of the disaster? So without going into any detail whatsoever, I can just say that these three aspects of uh, stress have consistently explained a lot of variance in child development over the years. So I followed up Project Ice Storm with four other natural disaster studies, uh, Iowa floods, floods in Queensland, Australia, the Fort McMurray wildfires, Hurricane Harvey in, um, in, in Houston, Texas. And in each of those, we recruited pregnant women as soon as possible after the disaster, assessed their stress, and have been following the development of their children. Uh, and then since uh, about two years ago, about two years ago, uh, we got involved in uh, COVID-19 studies. So the first three that I'll talk about uh, is one in Australia, another here um, in Canada, and uh, one in, in, uh, in Quebec. So all about pregnant women. So the question is, is the COVID-19 pandemic a natural disaster? Well, of course, if we look at these categories of threat, loss, change, and scope, uh, there's plenty of all of that. And, and especially scope is actually a bit of a challenge because the duration, uh, like when will it end, ask us BA2 variant, uh, but also in terms of the density, the entire globe is affected. So um, this is a very interesting aspect. And of course, subjective distress, um, is, uh, well, we've heard lots of reports of anxiety and depression, and those are natural responses. So um, the first person to approach me to create a scale of objective hardship was Pedro Rosanetto from, uh, from the Douglas. So we created the Montreal assessment of stress from COVID and called it MASK. I was pretty proud of that. Um, and then uh, for the conception study at Saint-Justin, 
uh, that which is called conception. We just called it CASC, not very creative after we had the mask. And then for the BITOC study in Australia, we created it and called it BASC. So the BITOC study, uh, BITOC stands for the birth in the time of COVID um, with the, the PI is Hannah Dolan in Sydney, Australia. Um, and there are many, many hypotheses. Uh, they're very interested in uh, midwifery care and prenatal care. Um, but the, some of the hypotheses include the idea that objective hardship and subjective distress from COVID could influence maternal mental health, um, but also birth outcomes and child outcomes. So this is a bit of a schematic. So looking at objective hardship and the effects on mental health and what might be uh, psychosocial moderators of that effect. In other words, who is most vulnerable? And for uh, child and birth outcomes, what about continuity of care? Because that's a, a really big theme for these researchers in Australia. So um, we've got two samples. The first one was recruited in 2020, starting in about uh, July and going several months. Uh, and, then, and then they stopped recruitment and then they realized, hey, this pandemic just keeps going. So a second uh, sample was recruited uh, starting in 2021. And uh, I just wanna say really quickly that a lot of the recruitment was through Facebook. Um, and we spent about three months cleaning out all the bots and the fraudsters in the database. So we followed up on the women um, postpartum at two, six, 12, and we're just starting now 24 month postpartum assessments. So again, we created these measures of objective hardship, subjective distress, and we uh, created a measure of the extent to which uh, the women were um, following um, public health guidelines. Okay, so uh, we created the BASC 150. So um, we, we had these different categories of exposure, made each one worth uh, a maximum of 50 points. For threat, uh, we just weighted threat to self um, more than threat to others. So to self, there was a maximum of uh, 33 possible points and so on. Uh, for loss, it was all financial. For change, we put uh, greater stress on um, changes to the pregnancy and prenatal care and things like that, uh, and, and, and on non-pregnancy. And we created this scope variable. Um, Guillaume Elge Bailey, the statistician from my lab, um, was very, very creative and um, smart in finding the data on um, in, in, in uh, each state of Australia, for example, to find out when were, was the first death and how many, uh, yeah. So looking at the duration of the pandemic in Australia and in each state, according to the date at which the, the mother uh, answered the questionnaire, but then also the intensity. So how many people had died in Australia? How many people had died in that particular state at the date that the woman answered the questionnaire? But also because people might be influenced by how many people have died this week, including like the last seven days. And we worked tirelessly to create uh, the scale, but that scale just kept giving us the finger, um, as you can see from this graph, and wound up like not correlating with anything. So we decided to leave it out of our overall measure and just have the Basque uh, 150. So the overall, yeah, so this is the, the, uh, the distribution of the Basque 150 with those three scales. So then we also created for the first time a subjective distress scale. Um, so everything about their distress about the pandemic uh, made it a maximum of 200 points equally between non-pregnancy related and pregnancy related uh, distress. So a lot of those questions were to what extent does following the public health measures, for example, um, are you distressed about it? And then there's a scale of one to seven. A lot of them are just like that. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty well uh, distributed. And then we asked them, how much did they use social distancing? How much did they use some of these other measures? Um, and so we have a public health. 
public health uh, directives scale. And uh, we, we included uh, in the recruitment questionnaire three, 33, okay, uh, three questions, that cognitive appraisal question from before about whether the, the consequences were uh, negative to extremely positive. Uh, also a question about resilience. From, it's from a, one of the resilience questionnaires. When things go wrong in my life, it generally takes me a long time to get back to normal. So a very uh, resilient person would strongly disagree and have a high score. And then tolerance of uncertainty. Uh, so uncertainty makes me uneasy, anxious, stressed, vulnerable, unhappy, or sad. And so um, a, um, let's see. So this, this was uh, scored in that, in that direction as well. So with a zero, one, and two. So uh, last summer I had uh, a little group working on these data. And somebody can tell me why this keeps happening to me when my slides are not progressing. That would be great. Okay, so uh, Amber Lee DePaolo, uh, her job was to look at how objective hardship predicted anxiety in the women at two months postpartum and the extent to which any of these three uh, kind of psychological variables would uh, moderate that effect. And in all three cases, she found that people who were highly resistant here in this red line at the bottom uh, or who had um, we're very tolerant of uncertainty. Over here, it's the, the uh, turquoise line at the bottom, or who had a positive cognitive appraisal, uh, that would be the red line down here at the bottom, that these people seem to be resilient to or buffered from objective hardships effects on anxiety, whereas the opposite was true for people who said they were not resilient or that they didn't have a good tolerance of uncertainty or who had a negative cognitive appraisal. Uh, another student at the time, uh, Sophie Bonnell Newman, looked at uh, social indicators like income, education, and um, neighborhood um, affluence. And uh, education and neighborhood affluence did not have an effect, but the woman's own level of education uh, was buffering. So those with a, um, a college or postgraduate degree uh, were not affected by objective hardship. The study uh, uh, PI'd by Anik Dahar at uh, Saint Justin. Um, I'm not really sure what the total, there were like 5,000 responders from Canada, US, and internationally. Uh, at one point, they uh, published about 2,500 that were currently pregnant when they answered the questionnaire. And they, there's a lot of um, qualitative questions and uh, several that are really uh, relevant to policy issues. So this is showing the number of women who were moderately or very concerned about these various things. So there are a lot of things in hospitals uh, that hospitals were doing that were worrying women. Um, this study I, I find is uh, really interesting. I don't have a, an objective uh, exposure um, measure for them, but uh, Geneviève Roche at Université Laval had been studying uh, women in prenatal education, both online and face-to-face -face since 2018. They were doing three time points of measurements at, pre at pregnancy three months, pregnancy eight months, and two, mo two months postpartum. And if you can follow this graph, we can show here that she had a large cohort of like 390 women who had completed all the measures before uh, COVID started in March, 2020. And then she has a cohort, come on please, okay. A cohort of women who completed time one and time two um, before COVID and time three after COVID, and then another uh, group down here. So the, the literature is full of these studies, um, very scary studies about how um, pregnant women are highly anxious and uh, depressed. Um, but what she showed is that uh, depression 
really didn't change. So this is the trajectory of depression in turquoise. It's the women from before COVID. In blue, it's women during COVID. The trajectory really didn't change. And the same with anxiety, there's um, the interaction is not significant despite having three to 500 people per group. Um, but if there were an effect, it would be there. Uh, with two minutes left, I just want to mention um, Pedro Rosa Neto's study. This was actually the first one that we looked at. It's a prospective study of older adults. Um, we very quickly created our questionnaire and they interviewed people um, between March and May in 2020. These are people that for whom they have uh, both pre-COVID and now with this interview um, during COVID measures of mental health. They're, one of their hypotheses is that social distancing would worsen cognition in uh, the elderly. So here you can see uh, Guillaume uh, and I created the mask uh, and this is, uh, these are the distributions. Uh, and then pretty quickly, NPI, this is uh, uh, distress about cognitive symptoms. Uh, long story short, because I have to wrap it up, is that uh, yes, indeed, um, social distancing worsened uh, at least um, people's distress about their um, psychiatric symptoms. Um, distress and PTSD accelerated uh, functional activity decline over time, uh, as did uh, a more negative cognitive appraisal. 1240, I have to stop. Thank you very much. No time for questions. And then the next one up is Shafei. And for my own research, I'm focused on uh, psychological issues in general among the older populations. Uh, I think from the first wave, uh, Statistic Canada already announced, you know, it's important to look at mental health issues and what have been discussed so far. I also reinforce, you know, mental health during pandemic is something that cannot be neglected. And this is a, just give you an idea when we talk about mental health issues during COVID, uh, that's included both mental health decline depression, anxiety, and sleep problems, suicidality, self-harm. So there is a quite a wide range of mental health issues during COVID. And uh, when we think about um, uh, uh, people under the pandemic, and we tend to think about those most vulnerable populations, and one of the special category will be the old older adults and people with underlying health conditions. And I think back to 2020, May or April, when we had the, the first wave of the pandemic, we know older adults are, you know, the most vulnerable population and need to be looked into, especially uh, Montreal as the epicenter of Canada. So we have a lot of older adults, especially those uh, residents living in long-term care facilities. They are struggling with the pandemic, the virus itself, and also the control measures. On one side, those control measures, you know, do per, uh, protect people from getting virus. On the other side, they also bring other challenges, especially psychological challenges, because those physical distancing and you know avoid the social contacts that cause additional problems and burden, psychological burden for our older uh, residents. And what I'm going to talk about actually two studies, but they actually connected uh, with each other because they all talk about the same psychological issues. So the first study is called a DISCOVER. So this is the study funded by uh, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. So uh, the full name is Determining uh, infection severity of COVID-2 in elderly residents. So I joined with the researchers from uh, RIMUHC and Concordia uh, to uh, trying to understand, you know, when we think about when older adults suffer from COVID-19 uh, and then not all the older population, not all the residents have the same format of the COVID or clinical com uh, complications. So there are meaning or there are reasons to explain they have a different fo uh, format of the COVID. 
And in order to figure out what kind of factors associated with a severe COVID-19, and we could think about immune system. We have a different immunity to respond to the, uh, the virus. We also know the COVID, uh, the various attacks differently for our cardiovascular systems. And also another large category will be psychological factors such as fear, anxious, depression, loneliness, isolation, etc. So together they collectively determine one's risk level in terms whether they're going to have a severe COVID-19 when they get you know, uh, <clears throat> the virus. So the overarching goal for this particular study is we're trying to come from biopsychosocial uh, angle and trying to think about for those elderly people, when they have a greater risk of developing uh, you know, medical complications of a COVID, what are the factors, what kind of a clinical uh, <clears throat> profiles associated with their severe COVID-19. And I'm leading the psychosocial aspects. So we use a mixed method study, uh, trying to understand the both you know, from quantitative perspective, and also the qualitative perspective in terms, you know, what kind of a psychosocial profiles associated with more severe uh, format of COVID-19. We focus on the following uh, psychological issues such as depression, uh, generalized, generalized anxiety disorder, sleep, loneliness, and social isolation. And for the qualitative aspects, we're trying to uh, figure out whether they have a special uh, needs put uh, in the category of a psychological needs uh, related to the COVID-19 or COVID-19 control measures, what kind of lived experiences and challenges both the residents and their loved ones or caregivers experience during the COVID-19, and what kind of changes or interventions they expect to have. So this is a study still ongoing. We are not finishing the recruitment, so I don't have a result for this one. So um, if you're interested, stay tuned. We will have more information about this particular study. On the second study, because we noticed during the data collection of this uh, residential uh, study, we noticed a lot of people complained about loneliness and isolation. And we know social isolation and loneliness are harmful, especially for older adults. And so then we look into the literature and see what kind of a situation for Canadian population, especially older Canadian populations. We notice 11% of older adults ages 65 and plus report loneliness. And then uh, the data actually, uh, the recent data from Statistic Canada report is up to 40%. So then we propose an umbrella review trying to get a uh, you know, a broader information in terms of loneliness, isolation, and other psychological needs among all the people ages 65 and plus. And we just get our first uh, review out. So we have the data for global prevalence of loneliness and isolation. So in general, we have a six in 10 people report having loneliness or isolation during pandemic. And we actually compare those data uh, with the following aspects, such as whether those data are reported within the first three months of the pandemic or after the first three months. We also compare different measures of prevalence, whether it's a point estimate or the period of uh, prevalence. We compare uh, the data coming from different parts of the world, whether it's from Asia, from uh, um, Europe all from America. We also compare the severity level of the COVID in that particular uh, uh, region with the study being carried out. And in the end, we notice the only differences is whether the uh, study being conducted within the first three months or after. The thing is, uh, for those studies report after three months prevalence rate, they actually report much uh, higher rate compared to those studies uh, re release the data from the first, within the first three months. And we notice that this is the same result, both for loneliness and isolation. And there are more information available from this study. And we are working on the other aspects of the umbrella reviews for now. Thank you. So 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patricia Silveira, and uh, I lead the Biodiversity Neurodevelopment and Mental Health TBG at the Douglas. And thank you, Suzanne, for organizing this and for the opportunity to share this work today. My lab is focused on the long-term effects of uh, early adversity and gene environment interactions. But as many of you, when the pandemic hit, uh, my students and staff were compelled to develop a side project to try to, to bring some contribution to deal with the crisis. And uh, like the other scientists using and, and that had purchased the UK Biobank data, we were invited and offered the opportunity to access the COVID-related data for free. So I'll tell you about a marker that we developed uh, using the expression-based polygenic score. That is a technique that we created in the lab. So you know that this is the classical picture of a GWAS in the Manhattan plot. We see the different chromosomes in the x-axis and the significance of the association between each SNP and the outcome of interest in the y-axis. We are looking at the GWAS for severe COVID infection here. Uh, this has been an effort done globally uh, through many studies, and this is the, the compilation of the data for severe, severe COVID-19. So the higher the bulletin is in the plot, the more significant the SNP is, uh, is associated with COVID, uh, severe COVID. Uh, so they describe the genetic background linked to higher risk for severe COVID in the general population. However, we know that other characteristics of the population, as we were talking up to now, not only genetics are very important to define risks for severe disease in COVID. The main one is age. So as we know, seniors have a much higher risk for being hospitalized and, and for dying from the disease than younger patients. And this PRS here identifies increased genetic risk but it, this is independent of these other factors like age, for example. And my lab has developed this different technique or new technique to calculate polygenic scores that adds other layers of information beyond genetics. These layers tell about the biological function of the genes that are included in the scores, their expression and the relationship with the other genes. So this transforms this quote unquote boring genetic data into a more dynamic tissue specific data and also allows for the exploration of more precise research questions. Uh, so in our experience, this score is better to define uh, gene environment interactions. So the methodology is devised first establishing the relationship between the genes in the specific tissue, then adding the information about gene expression in these genes and then applying it to samples that have genetic information to compare individuals based on the function of that gene network and in investigate the impact on health. For the, the, oh, sorry. For the COVID study, we wanted to identify specifically seniors that were at higher risk for hospitalizations for COVID-19. So not only increased genetic risk, but increased genetic risk in seniors. So using transcriptomic, uh, a transcriptome data set from Lieberman et al. Et al that has RNA sequencing data from the nasopharyngeal swabs from 430 individuals with uh, PCR confirmed uh, COVID and 54 negative controls, we created a genetic index that can successfully discern a group of seniors that have more risk for having severe COVID-19 and being hospitalized using the UK Biobank data. And uh, at this point, we had more than 70,000 participants in the data set. And this can be important for prevention of severe disease in this aging population by offering perhaps targeted care or intense vigilance uh, of cases before the disease develops. Now, this work is also important because we can perform bioinformatic analysis to define the genes that are more central to the network and possibly inform the development of specific therapies or preventive methods that could work better specifically in this population. So as the COVID crisis seems to be here to stay, this would be, could be very important for in the mid or longer term. And uh, that's it for today. I would like to thank my students, staff, collaborators, uh, the UK Biobank uh, that offered the opportunity to use the data for that and you for your attention. Thanks. Great, very, very important work. 
Um, we have a couple minutes for questions or comments to Patricia. Uh, and then after that, we can go into uh, general discussion or questions to other, um, other presenters. Again, if you have a question or comment, just shout it out. There appear to be no specific questions. Um, so I wanna thank uh, all the presenters and um, just open up for general comments or questions to presenters, anybody? I think I'm, I just wanna make a comment about, um, about internet surveys and internet recruitment. Um, we were really astonished with the BitTalk data in Australia. Um, so of course we had um, thousands of, of respondents and we asked them, of course, their, their first name, their last name and email address and so on. And at one point, our, the, the research assistant in Australia noticed that among the, in the, pre in the first names of people, that there were a lot of male names. <laughs> and this was supposed to be of pregnant women. And so we thought, well, this was very curious. And then we looked through and we saw that people with, um, had male names um, had very often uh, extremely fast uh, response times, like really, you, you, couldn't answer the questionnaire that fast, but they were answering it very quickly. Um, they also seem to be more often Aboriginal, more than you would expect. Um, and so we realized that our data were just full of bots. Um, and it took us literally three months to go through and create various algorithms, but really going through person by person to weed those guys out. And what it seemed like the bots are doing is they, they go through and they answer positively to everything. Um, that's why they were answering positively to being Aboriginal and that sort of thing. And so it makes me very, very worried about studies. Um, I know of one in particular with a very large population of pregnant women that is showing their, um, their anxiety and depression through the roof. And I, I don't think it reflects the general popul population. And I don't, I don't, and I have no evidence that, that they've actually been concerned about bots and, and weeding those out. Has anybody else had that kind of, uh, that kind of um, problem or concern? Uh, I, I may have the similar uh, impression in terms of web-based studies. But the, on the other hand is there is a lot of challenges if you do like a, a traditional approach to recruit participants for studies. Like for my study, um, the UnCOVID uh, Discover study, actually we don't have a large sample size so far. The, one of the challenges is, you know, we are facing uh, a group of uh, residents living in the SHLD and then they have a lot of uh, health issues, so they have a certain, you know, you know, additional roles in terms of who can contact and when you can contact those. And when we have a different waves of a COVID, and then that's add an additional layer in terms of recruit those residents and family members quickly. Uh, so I, I was going to bring up another question, maybe for Alan also, Mah Mahjusi and Suzanne, like when you recruit. The participants, whether it's a homeless people or general population or special age group, so what kind of the tricks that you guys have in terms of encourage people to participate? Well, one thing I found is that as soon as um, there's a dollar sign anywhere on your on your on your recruitment website, that um, yeah, you get a whole lot of people. Who, who want to um, who want to be involved uh, with the Hurricane Harvey study? I decided we're, we're going to go all out and get as many subjects as we can. So we offered twenty dollars to people for every questionnaire that they answered. Uh, but there again, we wound up having a lot of bots. So money helps. Mm -hmm. 
but um, it comes with its own dangers. Uh, just to say that for us, uh, in terms of recruitment for our uh, homelessness um, populations, uh, it was very hard to recruit them during the COVID because um, uh, uh, because we, we for sure we we cannot uh, recruit directly this population since we we know it's a population um, in, in fact it's former homelessness because uh, we recruit population uh, in supported housing so we have to work closely with uh, with with the clinician. Uh, and clinicians have to refer us um, the former homeless people uh, who are now in supported housing. And this was very hard to have this collaboration do, during the COVID because particularly, particularly in a community-based organization, uh, they had very difficulty to, uh, to, um, to get the, their staff. There were a lot of turnover in, in the staff uh, and a lot of organization were lacking. Some 30% of the staff were lacking. So, so uh, to work with the, and to help uh, us as a research project were really not a priority for them. So mm -hmm. for sure for us, it just took longer time. So we, we, we thought, you know, to finish this, this field very quickly and <laughs> maybe it took at the end uh, four times uh, more than it was supposed to, to, to be. So I think it's a very challenge when we want to uh, collect data as we used to do in the context of COVID because if we need help from clinician, from manager, it's, it's quite, uh, it's more difficult to get their help. Everybody's overwhelmed. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, my two cents too. Uh, but first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, Siang Fei's and Suzanne's um, contribution to the study that, that I uh, presented. Uh, they, were, they were partners. Um, I think that uh, the issue with, uh, you know, uh, how could I say, rotten data <laughs> from uh, the internet or, uh, you know, poor quality data. Um, I think that it depends on what platform you are and how much money you are offering. Um, in, in our case, we were not offering any money and we were on a, you know, relatively low tech platform, you know, so people were, you know, uh, people just um, participated out of, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, generosity or uh, so it was a convenient sample and we relied mostly on the word of mouth so it's just using the snowball technique but I think that if you want to recruit certain uh, clientels you have to go where they are where they hang out where, where they would be more likely to see you um, uh, I don't think it's 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 very easy but that's you know one way of going about and one thing we realized that we we didn't have any you know specific uh uh type of person that we wanted to recruit but we realized in the end that uh by using very much a word of mouth uh, we ended up with a very educated sample primarily female of uh, people who had uh, you know university degrees yeah <laughs> just no. because they were like us, you know, we were just uh, telling our friends and our friends were telling their friends and, uh, you know, one colleague is telling another colleague and we ended up with a rather, rather um, educated sample. But I think that, um, I think I, I'm, I'm really impressed by the diversity of research that has been launched as a result of the COVID. Uh, I didn't realize so much uh, was going on, so I'm... Uh, Favorably impressed. And at the Douglas, there, uh, Diane Boivin has a study on um, healthcare workers uh, that she told me about uh, just now. Um, and somebody else as well, I think, uh, Marie Claude Joffrey. So I, I, I put in the chat a link to um, a very interesting oops, article. Uh, the, these people did an internet survey. Um, with over a thousand responses, and they ended up developing a, a five-step data cleaning protocol to find because there are people who are just mischievous and they just want to mess up. They just want to mess with you, 
And they, they even had a CAPTCHA, you know, that thing where you have to click all the boxes that have a tractor or a fire hydrant, mm -hmm. they even had one of those. And nowadays the bots have algorithms to get around it. Mm -hmm. um, and so they ended up having to eliminate 60% of their data. Wow. From the internet server. I have another question that I would like to raise uh, for the group. Um, has anybody had difficulty uh, publishing their data related to COVID? We, we, we've had difficulty. Uh, we find that the journals are oversaturated with COVID papers and they're very picky. They're very, very picky. I'm really, I'm really worried about that because we have spent so much time and energy collecting data. And now for the first time in my career, I'm really afraid that I won't be able to publish my results. Hmm. Anybody else has experienced? Uh... Yeah, I've heard that there's a couple of journals um, that, you know, they, they say, don't send us any more COVID papers. No. But we, we haven't, uh, we, we've only submitted our, we've got two, three papers submitted from BitTalk um, and they, they were just submitted with them the last few weeks. So I don't know what they're uh, Well, good luck. Alan, Alan just uh, also you uh, tried the open access uh, journal and it's not wor working as well. Um, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know if I, uh, my, you know, this is a- You, know, you didn't fresh. try? You didn't try the open access. We journals. did try. We did try. But what I'm saying is that I, I I did not keep a tab on you know I don't you know my observation is very superficial you know I I haven't tabulated you know all our trials and errors and efforts and rejections but um, yeah that's good um, good point you know uh, open access journal are, are much less picky because they make money with your papers, so, yeah. You can, um, you can also put your papers in a, in a repository somewhere that is, uh, that is available, so you can cite it. Um, yeah. I know uh, Jerry Giesbrecht from uh, University of Calgary, uh, his first big paper on um, anxiety in pregnant women uh, was on some psychology uh, website before it he got yeah. published. So it was even with preliminary data. So the final one that he got published. Was well, you know, so far we have been, we, you know, we, we, we've, we've always been able to publish it, but I've been really impressed by the number of rejection and uh, the number of journals that said more or less openly, you know, oh, not another COVID paper, we're not interested. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, I think with, with everything that, that we're presenting here, each one of us has like a really different angle. Um, I think a lot of the papers were just kind of, you know, cross-sectional, you know, especially in psychology or psychiatry, um, people are anxious and depressed because- Yeah, but I, I so think it- have got something like that's really unique, like we all I'm have- not sure. I'm not sure that I buy that because it's like prejudice, you know, it's like, oh, COVID, I don't want it. I don't want to review it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't care whether your paper is good or not good. It's like prejudice. Mm. So I'm not sure that quality, you know, will, will, will make up for that or will ensure, you know, we tried to publish some, some of our papers, you know, were, were very good, you know, some of my papers some of the papers we published, you know, some of them, I, you know, I thought they were really finely crafted. Yeah. Anyway. Maybe through those special calls, Alain, I, I, I crossed by a few, you know, that uh, yeah. special calls for COVID. Then maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's also a good uh, idea, like special issues. Mm -hmm. Do you know which journals have you seen uh, special issues for, for COVID? Which one? Uh, Patricia? Yeah, well, I saw one recently in my field that is the e-biomedicine journal that, you know, publishes uh, genomics and 
it's not much on psychology, but I'm sure there are others as well in others, uh, yeah. other journals as well. Yeah. Good point. Good point, actually. I'm glad I raised this. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we do this kind of thing. Yeah, any other um, observations? Or... Um, Patricia, your, your slides went by really fast. I thought I saw something on IL-6. Yeah, I didn't have time to go deep into the, the score, but we, we focused for, for a series of reasons. Uh, we focused on IL-6 that seems to be, you know, the levels are, are increased in patients with uh, severe COVID and uh, IL-6 receptor, for example, has been uh, uh, investigated as a possible target for treatment. So our, our score is focused on, on the IL-6 receptor and the gene network that surrounds it. Uh, so with genes that were upregulated in the patients, uh, in the positive uh, patients. Okay, so when you were saying tissue specific, the tissue is blood? Is... No, it's the the nasopharyngeal aspirate. Oh, okay. That's where they do they did the RNA sequencing. Okay. So theoretically, is the respiratory tract, uh, and then our score is also when we weight the score, the SNPs. We also use uh, lung specific uh, gene expression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. IL six is my favorite IL. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, there's nothing else then. Uh, Bonnie, 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 uh, there, there is a question. Yeah, hi, sorry. I've been like trying to put it all together into a question and I guess it's kind of for all of you. Um, there's one population that we haven't heard very much about here, which is the kids. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a little bit back and forth, most, mostly social media, you know, garbage. But, but I'm curious from your professional perspectives, what you think like how we can measure what's happening for that population. And Suzanne, for you especially, what you've seen with previous disaster work, how that relates to the children of those mothers that have gone through it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I see that Mia McLean, the woman in the, uh, the blue uh, cap just joined us. Um, she was on the original uh, Queensland flood study in Australia as a doctoral student, and now she's at uh, UBC. And she's, uh, she's been uh, looking at the data from the six month postpartum. Uh, Mia, can you, can, are, you with, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hello, Mia. hi, sorry. Hello, Mia. Good to see you, I'm sorry to miss your talk. I put it in my calendar at the wrong hour. Uh, <laughs> apparently we, I have a PhD, but I can't work out the west to east coast time difference yet, uh, so. <laughs> Well, we recorded um, it. Yeah. We recorded it, so what we can. Yes, say I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying that to you. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, what are we finding with COVID with the kids? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I can say from other work that people are finding that if mothers were infected with COVID, there's no adverse outcomes on their neurodevelopment um, around six months. And then in our study, we've been looking at the stress that women are experiencing in relation to neurodevelopmental outcomes. And what we see is that with greater objective hardship, so just exposure to um, the, the disaster, you can tell I've got this language ingrained in me, um, but in relation to this pandemic, uh, the kids have a higher negative reactivity um, and that they're also, they show uh, lower scores on social communication and motor, I believe, um, at six months. And so what well, the good news is though, um, that some of my preliminary data is suggesting that if uh, mothers had a very strong relationship with their care provider throughout the perinatal period, um, and specifically, this looks like women who, who have uh, in Australia and oh, Canada, we have midwives too. So they have a midwife who they see across the perinatal period. Um, this has provided some sort of social support uh, and that they were not seeing this, um, the, the relationship between higher exposure 
and poorer outcomes. So these kids seem to be um, buffered, I guess, in that way from the fetal programming. Um, so this is just preliminary data, but it is good news and it falls in line with the work that Suzanne and my old supervisor, Gabrielle Simcock did in the uh, 2011 floods, where we also sh showed a promotive effect or a buffering effect of um, the continuity of care provi provided throughout the perinatal period. Um, more broadly in research, uh, I think it's gonna be, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think it will be really interesting to look at say, kids with who were around toddler age and preschool age, where language development was still continuing to be forming, where social skills are really kind of paramount to setting the stage um, for later development. And so it will be really interesting um, to look at, you know, those cohort, those co cohorts of children who weren't in the prenatal period exposed, but were exposed in early development. Uh, so I guess I'll just keep tuned for more research on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, selfishly with my friends with kids, it's like everything out the window at the beginning, right? You just focus on keeping them alive and busy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with like that group. Yeah. Um, Mia, I just want to introduce you to Marie-Josée Fleury, um, who was one of the presenters. She's uh, a researcher in the Douglas. And uh, Marie-Josée, it seems to me that you've done quite a lot of work on the continuity of care, right? That's one of your big uh, research themes over the many years. Yeah, great. And um, yeah, I don't know if, you know, maybe we can look at some of your work or you can lend some of your expertise, but we're definitely showing both mm. in the Queensland flood study and I think also in, um, in BITOC now with COVID, uh, that continuity of care is a protective factor. Although apparently not for the birth outcomes. We have not found any no. predicts like birth weight or gestational age of birth. Nothing. Just to tell you uh, on this, uh, Suzanne, that uh, for sure, uh, the last work that I have done uh, are all based on the, the, the investigation of big database, like, like I explained, and we created also um, an index of continuity of care. And um, in all our work today, for sure, when we look at, uh, when we work with big database as well, we do, do not have a, a lot of uh, adverse outcome that we can use because we cannot see uh, if the person has still, you know, a mental disorder or thing like that. So often we use, uh, you know, indicator of adverse outcome like uh, frequent ID use or hospitalization, or we can also uh, look at a suicidal ideation, mortality. It's, al it's always the, 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 it is the most common uh, adverse outcome that we are looking at. And each time that we do statistic and try to understand uh, what drive more those adverse outcomes? Uh, we have uh, always continuity of care as a protector of those. So people with more continuity of care from physician uh, that can be the, uh, uh, the uh, family physician or the psychiatrist, uh, those with more continuity of care will have a better uh, better protection against those adverse outcomes. Uh, we are we have looked at frequency of uh, of uh, services use and this it's, it's we try it different way and this uh, it, it's very interesting because we can see that if we look at all the quality indicator in services use we can see that continuity of care really protects again adverse outcome but frequency of services use not. Uh, we we uh, we also created we try to understand okay frequency but frequency each month because you can you know in, in a twelve months basis you can you know see tw twelve times uh, the physician in the first month and after finish <laughs> or you can look each 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 month and this will be better I, I imagine and we tried different construction and it's not uh, protecting so it's interesting to see that you know um, continuity of care is it's very important in terms of protecting patients yeah. that uh, doesn't bode very well for healthcare in Quebec where people can't find a family physician to have that kind of continuity the, the day I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter 30 years ago, um, I contacted uh, um, the, the family physician that was following a colleague uh, at the Douglas, and she's been my physician now for 30 years. 
and it, it's it's great and it's so sad that so many people can't have that kind of when, when we look at very vulnerable population, uh, we have often like some like 50% of our cohort without family physicians, because for sure in the big database, again, we cannot uh, know it. Uh, a physician, it's a family physician or the usual provider, but we construct this variable as well. You know, there is a way to construct and to to um, to understand if this practitioner, it's a usual, you know, a physician or not, kind of a proxy of family physician or psychiatrist, and um and we can and and most in most of our uh, very vulnerable cohort, uh, a patient with uh, substance related disorder, a high ID user, uh, most of them I will be, I will say fifty percent do not have uh, any uh, great follow up with the usual. Physician. Position. This is the really this had really to be improved a lot. Do you, do you have any kind of a review article on on your work on uh, continuity of care? Marie Jose, have you written? Uh, so I apologize, but uh, what what did you ask me? Have you written any kind of review papers on uh, your work on continuity of care? If I have paper to share, it, it's your question. Yeah. Yeah, I have to look at, at them because uh, I, I do not have any paper, I, I believe, just on continuity of care. Usually, uh, continuity of care, it's one of my one of the variables that I have, that I'm looking at, that, uh, as I said, that protects, again, adverse events. Uh, um, I have to look at my maybe whole work. But uh, since a couple of years, I'm mostly working on big data uh, base and I use continuity of care. Uh, I created kind of proxy of this usual physician and I have constricted a lot of quality indicator and I'm more using it, it, them as kind of uh, enabling or enduring factor for adverse event. Okay, thanks. Um, Alana, in the end, I, I don't think you had very many pregnant women in your no. No, I had only a few dozen. So I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything with it. I don't think I so. Don't think so. And, and Bonnie, um, I'm not sure we've met before, but uh, are you a student at the Arthur Douglas? Yeah, I'm with Patricia and Michael Meany's lab. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I've been in a lot of your meetings, but hi, yeah. I'm a postdoc. Hi, <laughs> and, and Muzi, I know she works with uh, Shang Fei and Guillaume and Shinwan and Lei. Okay, well, uh, this was fun. <laughs> so unless there's any other comments, 